Listen now to the readings this morning for Thanksgiving Sunday. Hear first a word from Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter, beginning at the 7th verse. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs, flowing forth in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, out of whose hills you can dig copper, and you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Take heed, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes, which I command you on this day. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built goodly houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness with its fiery serpents, scorpions, and thirsty ground, where there was no water, but who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do good in the end. Beware, lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers as at this very day. And then turning over to the Gospels, hear a word from the sixth chapter of Matthew, Jesus speaking near the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore I tell you, Do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, or about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O men of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them all. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be yours as well. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but Thanksgiving is one of my favorite holidays of the year. And I think it's my favorite because it is one of the last major holidays, in my opinion, that remains uh, uh, with a a kind of a purity around it. Uh, What I love about Thanksgiving is uh, uh, what you don't have to do. Uh, There's no gift exchange. There's no series of uh, pre-Thanksgiving events to attend. You don't have to decorate your house with uh, Thanksgiving lights or, or, or put up an inflatable turkey in the front yard. Though I will say there's one lady in my neighborhood who I think would gladly put up an inflatable turkey if they made one. I, I, uh, she likes to decorate. But I like Thanksgiving partly for the simplicity of it all. I mean, to get Thanksgiving right, what's expected but to sit down with people that you care about, to eat together, and then just to reflect on the fact that it is good to be alive and how good God is to uphold us day by day as our time on this earth unfolds. 
And yet, you know, even with that simple goal in mind, I was having a harder time than usual getting in a Thanksgiving mood this week, given all the bad news, you know, places like Paris and Mali and all of those terrorism-related headlines that have been kind of beating us over the head the last several days. Uh, and, and then I thought a little more deeply, and it occurred to me that there is at least something very historically consistent about observing Thanksgiving in a time of adversity or, or, or even danger, because that is, after all, if you remember, how Thanksgiving began. Uh, the, the portrayal most of us got of Thanksgiving in grade school, you know, the, the picture of the happy pilgrims and the happy Native Americans gathered around a big banquet table in their finest regalia, all cheery and, and all being right with the world. Most historians say that's a very romanticized version of what actually happened back in 1621. The truth uh, surrounding the events of the first Thanksgiving were pretty harrowing, uh, to say the least. Uh, do you remember? Uh, the historians say that fully half, one half of those first hardy souls that we call pilgrims, folks who had one year earlier uh, left England, stayed in Amsterdam and Holland for a while, and finally caught the Mayflower, the, the first settlers uh, to, across the Atlantic to New England, fully half of those pilgrims had died from the time they hit the shore in fall of 1620 to the first Thanksgiving time in 1621. By the time of the first Thanksgiving, there were only three families, three settler families in, of the original, uh, uh, those on the original Mayflower, who had not had to bury somebody in their immediate family, a, a, a wife, a husband, a child. And, and beyond that, all of them, whether they had survived or not, all of them had just gone through a winter where they were all facing really a, a real prospect that they might all starve to death. You may remember they had brought plants and seeds with them on the Mayflower, uh, uh, hoping to pr help provide provisions for the winter, but the barley they planted uh, did very poorly, and the peas didn't grow at all, and it was, in fact, the corn given by the natives. That part of the grade school story is right. The, the natives helped them learn to cultivate corn, and that had saved them from starving. And now, as the, the fall had come around and they were facing another winter there in New England, they had uh, uh, put in the, the larder basically two pounds of corn per person per day which they were feeling very good about. It looks like we'll be able to get through the next winter of 1621. And when I think of the pilgrims, given those circumstances, given that context for their life, I mean, uh, the, the thanks that they were giving that first fall reminds me of something that Peter Gomes, the, the late uh, uh, chaplain at Harvard Memorial Church once wrote. He said that if you really want to be thankful at Thanksgiving, you have to do more than just count your blessings and think of the best things of your life. Uh, Gomes used to say that if you really want to be thankful, don't just think of your best days, you need to think also of your very worst days, your lowest moments in your life. Think of those moments, Gomes said, when, when you didn't know where to turn and, and, and reflect on the fact that you were at such a low point and somehow by God's grace, you got through it. Think of your low moments, not just your best moments, Gomes said, and then think of who brought you through, and then you'll really start to feel a more overwhelming sense of gratitude. And it occurs to me, that's pretty much went on, what went on that first Thanksgiving. It was a time for them to say, despite your hardships, thanks for bringing us through. Thanks for, for, for watching over us. Thanks for giving us this new land. It, it, it goes all the way back to their roots in the Bible. You know, they were people of the Bible as, as we are, and this week it's our turn to remember that whatever good or bad is happening in our lives at the moment, gratitude is a, 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 the fundamental emotion of our faith. Gratitude lies at the very heart of Christian faith. It's not guilt, as sometimes the church has seemed to teach either by a precept or example. It's not a sense of duty or obligation that's at the center of our religion, uh, as we sometimes have concluded. It's gratitude, this honest response to God's unmerited goodness toward us. None of us have earned it. 
but we simply receive it as a gift. And so our natural faith response is thanks. And when it comes to cultivating a genuine sense of thanks, it, it struck me this week that there are two kind of dimensions of that that you find in the Bible. One way of evoking a spirit of thanksgiving is, is what we do really by an act of will. You know, the, the truth is that we are not, as uh, thinking uh, moral beings, uh, a slave to our emotions. We have some control over how we choose to look at life and the attitude that we are going to take on as we go through uh, our, our, our days, whatever our experience may bring. And, and we have a choice to make in terms of our perspective or the lens that we will use to look at our experience and what is happening. And that's independent of how we may feel about things. And so there is a dimension of thanksgiving in the Bible that is really kind of related to our wills. Uh, you find it going all the way back to that old reading from Deuteronomy. When your fields produce and your sheep herd abounds, thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, the writer of Deuteronomy says. Beware, lest thou forget. Say not in thine heart, my power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. In other words, you know, get used to seeing your life through this lens of appreciation rather than expectation because doing that will make a huge difference in, in, in so many ways, how you interpret, how you respond to the life events that come your way. Uh, when you, when you, you see somebody who has that fundamental perspective of appreciation rather than condemnation. You know, th th there is just something contagious about that. A little more than a week ago now, I was out in Estes Park for a few days of vacation, and, uh, and I had dinner with longtime friends of mine, Dale and Peggy Beck. Some of you know them because before moving to Colorado, uh, Dale was my counterpart over at First Methodist Church in Normal. But after they retired, he and his wife Peggy moved to what they thought would be their dream retirement home. Just a mile from the entrance to the National Park, this beautiful spot in Estes Park, they had, uh, they had a, a, before they retired, bought a tiny little vacation cabin there, but when they retired, they had the whole thing remodeled and expanded, and they got, I mean, it was a beauty. It was just a wonderful thing, and they all settled in, ready to enjoy their retirement. But within just a few months after they moved, a forest fire, swept through their neighborhood, and it was driven by these enormously high winds. It went so fast, they had no time to do anything but just get in the car and screech out of the driveway. I mean, they, they lost everything. You know, family pictures, uh, mementos from their kids' uh, upbringing, uh, diplo college diploma, everything was gone. And uh, undaunted, you know, they, 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 they were not going to be uh, run off by that. They, they, patiently rebuilt, had a, uh, a contractor right on site as soon as they can, and they got their house, again, beautifully rebuilt, lovely house, ready to settle in now after that loss to fire. And uh, that was the year, the house was finished, was the year that Estes Park experienced what they called a thousand-year flood. Do you remember this? <laughs> it was, uh, the rain just it came, and, and, and the roads to, the, to town were washed out all the way. How, you know, the, the, Hot water streaming under the foundations of houses for, for days. And, and undaunt, Dale and Peggy, now having rebuilt this beautiful new house, they had to dry everything out. And, and last, last week I ate dinner with them, and we talked about all that. I said, are you expecting a plague of locusts anytime <laughs> soon? Uh, but they said, you know, you know, all of this has taught us how, how little those things matter, and it's taught us to savor our lives as we've never, we've never done before. Uh, God has been so good to us. Through all of this, we still are learning our lessons of what it means to be faithful. And I'm like, wow, you know, I, I marvel at people who have that kind of a lens to see life with a sense of gratitude, irrespective of what's going on, to see life in its, uh, in its strengths rather than its, rather than its weaknesses. Um, there is a, I, I looked it up, there is a Stoic uh, philosopher, Epictetus, uh, in the first century who wrote it, uh, said it really quite better than I can. He said, he is a man of sense who does not grieve over what he has not, but rejoices in what he has. I mean, that's, that's a thanksgiving that's, that's motivated out of an act of will. I'm going to choose to be thankful. Uh, and, and, you know, researchers tell you um, that people who, ex who are more grateful 
tend to get sick less. They tend to have uh, you know, an elevated sense of, of mood uh, over, over other people. They tend to, to have a more uh, healthy relationships. It's an interesting thing. Uh, th th your, your grandmother was right when she, when she made you write that thank you note to Aunt Sue for those uh, socks that she knitted you that you really didn't want uh, because there is a sense in which, independent of how you feel about things, to begin to express gratitude starts to turn your way of seeing everything in a, in a different and healthier way. I remember years ago in a little country church I served, one of our members, a uh, longtime supportive member of the church, on her offering envelope every week when she put her offering in the plate, she had written, not her name, but thank you, with an exclamation point on that envelope. Every week, put that offering. We knew who she was because that's, that was just the way she went. To, she felt it was a privilege to have lived another week and put that offering plate. Another, I'm here to be able to put my offering in the plate one more week, and for which she was very grateful. And it may help to know uh, we have a role to play in our own attitude as we approach the Thanksgiving table, especially if you've been, like I have, was this past week, feeling a little down, given all the hard news that's been uh, coming at us these past several days. So that's one piece, but I will say there's more in the biblical record than just the, the, uh, the, the wisdom out of Deuteronomy and its emphasis on you know, Thanksgiving as a force of will. And that's why I included a couple of other lessons that reminded me anyway that gratitude isn't only an act of will. Sometimes it's something that just washes over us as a kind of a discovery or a moment of wonder when we uh, let ourselves experience it. Psalm 65, which we, we read responsively, is a great example of that. You know, as, as Psalms go, Psalm 65 is not a particularly memorable one. It's certainly not somebody's going to make a, uh, you know, you don't see cross-stitch wall hangings of Psalm 65. And no, nobody asks to have Psalm 65 read at their funerals or, or weddings or anything like that. It, it's, it's in some ways unremarkable, except for the fact that it is just a poem of thanks that was obviously penned by a faithful soul who had quit rushing around long enough to let his imagination kick in. And when he did that, he found that his surroundings were just kind of overflowing with signs of the goodness of God, that there was a God he could see in his everyday surroundings who was creatively at work and, and powerful and, and coming at him from every corner. But I'll read you just the section of this again, this time in a more modern translation. Sometimes modern translations don't, don't lose their poetry. Here's one from the New English Version. Thou dost crown the year with good gifts. The palm trees drip with sweet juice. The pastors in the wild are rich with blessing, and the hills are wreathed with laughter. The meadows thy give, you give are clothed in sheep, and the valleys mantled in corn. They shout for joy, so they break into song. To me, that is a kind of a perfect pre-holiday psalm, if only for the way it reminds us that, that it, it, sometimes the best thing we can do to, to, to take on the goodness of God is stop rushing around and, and just, uh, just look. Just look and see from all corners of life where the goodness is coming. You know, it, it's not enough to make being appreciative just one more item on our to-do list. Slow down, the psalmist says. Uh, look around and you're sure to hear valleys singing to you and little hills laughing and you're sure to be struck by the assurance that you live in a world where there's still is abundance and joy just to be had, if only we will see it. The temptation I think we have as holidays approach is to think that the wonder and the goodness of holidays is up to us to manufacture. You know, we have to be the ones to make the holidays warm and thrilling. We have to get just the right gift for everybody. We have to create the right mood. But I would just point out the psalmist is of a different mind. He says, no, if you just slow down, you'll see that God will do all of that which sounds actually a lot like what Jesus counseled uh, near the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Don't be anxious about stuff. He says, be not anxious about your life, what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat. Uh, consider the lilies. Look around and see them. Look at the birds of the air. See how God takes care of them? So much more will he take care of you. So 
We have a uh, joyful, simple holiday coming up this week, and my point uh, this morning is also simple. Um, point one, gratitude is something that we have a stake in. We can cultivate it by a force of will. We can adjust our expectations. Uh, forget not the benefits of the Lord thy God. Say not in thine heart, my own strength hath gotten me this goodness. But it also comes gratitude, healthy gratitude. It also comes when we slow down and just let the, the mystery and the wonder of God wash over us. The pastures are alive and the hills sing with joy. Both those dimensions make Thanksgiving complete. Uh, Harold Kushner, some of you know that name, great uh, rabbi and author, uh, he, he said it like this, I thought very well. He says, gratitude needs to be more than remembering to mumble thank you. It's more than ritual politeness. Gratitude is a way of looking at the world that does not change the facts of your life, but has the power to make your life more enjoyable. And then he goes on, Kushner does, to, to illustrate what this means. He says, each night as I prepare for bed, I put drops in my eyes to fend off the threat of glaucoma that would rob me of my sight and take from me the pleasure of reading. And each morning at breakfast, I take a pill to control my blood pressure. And each evening at dinner, I take another to control my cholesterol level. level. But instead of lamenting the ailments that come with growing older, instead of wishing I was young and as fit as I once was, I take my medicine with a prayer of thanks, that modern science has found ways to help me cope with these ailments. And I think of all my ancestors who didn't live long enough to develop the complications of old age and did not have pills to take when they did. I think of all this, and I am heartfelt to smile. In this season of Thanksgiving, my prayer is that God will open our eyes to the gifts all around, the gift of this new day, the gift of people to love, quiet evenings, and most of all, the gift of a loving and risen Christ who dwells in the imagination of our hearts and at the center of our lives. Amen.